lead us in prayer this morning. Yes. Everyone, let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we praise and we thank you for this new day, this new opportunity to study your word together uh, with each other, uh, Lord, and especially on this day where hundreds of millions of people all around the world, even billions, are uh, thinking or contemplating uh, the birth of the Messiah. And we thank you for that story, Lord. We, we're pretty sure it didn't happen on this day, but we don't. doesn't matter, Lord. We, we rejoice uh, in the prophecies that there would be a virgin who would give birth uh, to uh, a child and his name would be Emmanuel, God with us. And we thank you that you truly are with us. We thank you for the savior of the world who died for all of our sins. May, Lord, many, many people come to that revelation uh, that that there is a savior, that there is forgiveness of sins, which is a free gift. And with that comes eternal life. Bless our time, Lord, as we uh, open up your scriptures in Yeshua, his precious name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, everyone, we had, last week we finished the book of Genesis. I know we only started towards the end um, in the Parashat Shavua, the weekly portion. Today we're beginning the book of Exodus. Now, the word Exodus is an English word, and it really, it means, it's talking about the departure from Egypt, but that's not the Hebrew word that's used. The Hebrew word is the word Shemot, and Shemot is a plural form of the word name. So it literally means names. And um, it actually begins with naming of the family of Jacob. Remember how, ex uh, how Genesis ends? The reconciliation of Joseph and his family and his brothers. And then his father, Jacob, comes down to Egypt, puts a blessing on all the sons, a prophetic blessing. They're... Uh, they're um, not only their destiny, but their identity, because the names that they were given, all the names of the sons, Dan, Benjamin, Issachar, Zebulun, Gad, Yosef, and so on, they, every name had a characteristic about it. And so the names were attached to their destiny, and the prophecies that were given by Jacob were connected and actually fulfilled over many, many generations so exodus picks up on that uh, narrative where the brothers are in egypt we've got the death of jacob we've got the death of joseph at the end of genesis but it's not the end last week we talked about how uh the parashat of shavua was called Va vayachi which means and he lived and it wasn't the end, even though they died, because the sons, they carried on the promise given to Abraham. When God said to Abraham, to you and your descendants, I give the blessing. And uh, so there's a continuation. And the names, the writing of the names and the identity of the names is just a further continuation of that. And, uh, and like I said, the names are connected to their identity. And their identity is going to be severely tested in just a minute. Why do I say that? Because in the midst of everything going well for the Israelites, it actually says in the first few verses, if you read, if you've got your Bibles, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 6, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly and they increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. By the way, in the Hebrew, it's the same words used where God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Puru uruvu. And uh, I don't know if the author's intent when he used those Hebrew words was to connect us to 
God's command to Adam and Eve, but they are the words that are used, be fruitful, multiply. But also in the Hebrew, it doesn't just say that they were fruitful. It actually talks about they, um, they absolutely multiplied, almost like uh, insects or animals. It was just a massive multiplication. And it kind of comes out in the English a little bit, where it says they increased in numbers, beca they became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So on the one hand, this is a positive. But on the other hand, it created a problem. And what was the problem? The problem is some people don't like seeing other people prosper. They become jealous or threatened or envious. Jealousy and, env and, and, and envy. Very close, but very different. You can be jealous of someone, but then it crosses a line to where you actually envy them, which then goes into hatred. But you can also be threatened by them as well. And it would seem pretty clear that Pharaoh, who, look what it says in verse 8, then a new king who came, uh, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. In the Hebrew, it just says he did not know Joseph. Now, have you ever thought about that? What does it mean he did not know Joseph? impossible that he didn't hear about Joseph, okay? Because Joseph was, he saved Egypt. Everyone knew who Joseph was. Joseph was the savior. He, you know, he saved them by his dreams and by uh, prophesying or predicting or interpreting the dreams that there would be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And those dreams saved Egypt and made them the superpower. So everyone would have known uh, about Joseph. But by this stage, Joseph had died. Okay, So I think it really means he didn't know him personally. And I, it's interesting, this translation, it says in English, uh, uh, to whom Joseph meant nothing to him. Uh, that's not what it says in the Hebrew. All it says is he didn't know him. But uh, I like that in English translation. He meant nothing to him and uh, because Joseph had died by now and Pharaoh was in power and he was threatened by this potential overtaking of, uh, by these Israelites. You know, it's his homeland. Pharaoh, Pharaoh's living in his own homeland and he's seeing a foreign people uh, multiplying. This is a real threat so what does he do he turns on them and look what he says verse 9 look the israelites have become far too numerous for us come we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out they will join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country now uh, the the English word here is shrewdly. Some other translations are uh, cunningly or wisely. The Hebrew word is chachma or chacham, which means wise. Let us deal wisely with them. Now, think about this, everyone. Uh, Pharaoh was not stupid. He, he, I mean, I also would be threatened. Uh, and what he starts to undertake is a cool, calculated, planned strategy against these people to what? To do what? To actually make their life a living hell, actually. So not very pleasant. And of course, that brings up a real touchy subject. And that's the subject of the suffering of God's people. Very, very touchy uh, topic. Um, yeah, good point, Gary. Gary just made a point, even though only 70 descendants of Jacob, whom God uh, named, were there. But 
it would seem over a period of time that they were multiplying very fast, even though the account mentions only 70. But that, that uh, commandment to be fruitful and multiply was, and by the way, in the English, where it says God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say he said, it says he commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. That's why today, if you go for a tour in the ultra-Orthodox community of Israel, especially the Meir Sharim, the ones in Jerusalem, you will see Orthodox Jews walking down the road, four, six, eight, 10, 12 children. Uh, and they get married very young. They get married at uh, 17, 18, 19, 20, and they have children very, very fast. And the, this is the reason why, because God commanded them be fruitful and multiply. And they see children as a blessing. You know, we, even in the Christian church, they say children are a blessing of the Lord. The, the parents don't realize until the kids get to the teenage years that it's not always the kind of blessing that you're looking for. But uh, that's the mindset um, in Judaism, at least, that children are a blessing of the Lord. And even in the Catholic Church, you know, Catholics are against contraception because of this reason. Uh, so they're multiplying here, uh, not Herod, Pharaoh is threatened and he sets about to make life tough for them. But this really brings up this topic of suffering, suffering, the, the Jew, just like Joseph, a, a generation before, Joseph did nothing wrong. In fact, the opposite, he ran from Potiphar's wife and it got him in trouble. Now the Israelites, they're doing nothing wrong, but they're in trouble. So this is a, a tough pill to swallow for believers. And the reason why I think it's important for us to address it, friends, is that there are probably in the millions of Christians who have shipwrecked their faith and left their faith because of persecution, suffering, whatever. In fact, if you look at the parable of the sower, when the Lord talks about the seed that fell on shallow ground, and then when he interpreted it, he said, this stands for someone who hears the word of God, but because of persecution and affliction, and they do not have root within themselves, they fall away. And this is something we need to know, that suffering, it is part and parcel of living. Job said, as sparks fly upward, so is man born for trouble. Not very comforting words, but um, it's, it's a sad part of life. And we as believers, we're not exempt from it, but, but, and we're going to see this, we're going to see this. God is, he's not the author of evil, but he is the Lord over all evil. I like that statement. I heard that once. He's not the author of evil, but he is the Lord over all evil and somehow if we can find the peace and the presence of the lord in our suffering that i think is a challenge to give us a grace to give us comfort and succor in the midst of our suffering well the israelites certainly were crying out right they cried out and they cried out and it actually went on for 400 years and i know i'm jumping the gun a little bit but um, uh, they, uh, they suffered a very long time. Now, look what happened. Look, read down to verse, uh, let's read again, verses eight and nine. Uh, there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the children of Israel are more mighty than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it would come to pass that when there falls out any war, they join our enemies and fight against us, and get them up out of the land. Therefore, they set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, 
Pithom and Ramesses. But look at verse 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they, the Egyptians, were grieved because of the children of Israel. Pay attention to that verse, everyone. Verse 12, the more they were afflicted, the more they grew. And you know what this is talking about? This is talking about overcoming. The Israelites, even though they had these Egyptian taskmasters who were dealing shrewdly with them, wisely with them, talk about hard affliction. We remember this, right, Gary, on the Passover night where we eat the bitter herbs. When, if you've never been to a Jewish Seder, one of the things you eat at the table is, is the bitter herbs to remind us of the bitterness in, uh, in Egypt. And yet they overcame. They, in, in, the more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied. This is incredible. And again, this is a good, uh, good lesson for us uh, to keep multiplying, to keep being fruitful and multiplying. And, you know, the theme of our study today is Shemot, which is the Hebrew word for Exodus, names, okay? And I talked at the beginning about the Israelites, they were given the names, the 12 sons of, of, uh, of Jacob, and they bore those names, and everyone who came from that family, they became a tribe. So you would say back in those days when you lived in Egypt, if you bumped into another Israelite, you would say, oh, what family are you from? Oh, I'm from the family of, of uh, Issachar, or I'm from the family of Zebulun, or Naphtali, or I'm from the tribe of Naphtali. And they, their identity in Egypt, and by the way, Egypt was a very dark place. Death was a big part of society in Egypt. They glorified death. They focused on the afterlife and the mummification of bodies. They put a lot of emphasis on the next life and reincarnation, and all of that. I've told you before that Egyptologists, those who study ancient Egypt, have discovered that Egypt was a very fatherless society because they've only been able to find mummies, not daddies. Okay, that's the joke of the day. But uh, the point is, it was a very dark society. And uh, so for the Israelites to keep their identity under suffering, under affliction, and overcome at the same time, this is quite something. And I believe the secret to that happening was what we call the favor of the Lord. Because if you read down to verse 16, look at verse 16, what happened. Actually, let's go to verse 15. And this is the story of the midwives, the Egyptian midwives. Look what happened. It says in verse 15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stall, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. And look at verse 17. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Now, guys, we need to, we need to break this down. you got to understand, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he was basically, he was God to the people. 
In Egypt, they had many, many gods, but Pharaoh was the living epitome of God. And what his word uh, was, that was the word of God. You didn't question it. You bowed down. If he said night when it was daytime, you believed it was night. And so for the midwives to actually go against the king, this was pretty brave of them to do. And I think this is a real interesting time for us to read these verses. Okay, now I don't want to get too much into this because these are hot topics. But when it comes to COVID and when it comes to vaccinations, and when it comes to what the governments are cracking down on and saying this and saying that, and if you don't do this, you're going to lose your job. And if you don't do that, and I don't want to take any sides what you should do or what you shouldn't do anyone. But what I'm saying is based on this story, this, this is a really good lesson that the midwives, they feared God and God took care of them. That's all I will say. I'll leave the rest up to you to interpret that into your situation because here's the thing i know people who have prayed about taking the vaccination and they feel peace about taking the vaccination and i know people who have prayed and they feel not to take the vaccination and they feel peace about not taking the vaccination so are they both hearing from god maybe maybe so maybe in different cases uh, there is different rules for each person. And maybe someone doesn't have the faith to lose their job. Like I was talking to a girl yesterday in England. She's a dentist. And she told me that there are 185,000 workers in the National Health Service in, in the UK. They're either going to get fired or they're going to, um, um, what do you call it, um, leave. What's the word I'm looking for? Not retire. They're going to resign. They're going to resign from their work or get fired. And uh, she is facing that real possibility, which means she's going to have to trust God in a way that she's never had to before. Scary, scary. But look at this passage, everyone. Not only did they fear God, but look, let's read it again in verse 20. So God was kind to the midwives and, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. So I love that uh, passage. And I think it's very timely for all of us today. The favor of the Lord. Amen. Now, another theme, if we go to chapter two, is the theme, and it's a continuation of the suffering and the affliction, is that God sees and he cares for his people who are being afflicted. Look at chapter 2, verse 24. Actually, let's go to 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and they cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. Verse 24, God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So here we have a beautiful uh, picture of the, the caring, concerned God. And, uh, you know, I know it took a little bit long for the writer. I can see Gary laughing. I know it took a little bit long for God to be concerned. And I know some of us may question that. God, okay, uh, it's better late than never, but, you know, Lord, it, 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 you know, did you not hear our complaining 100, 200, 300 years ago? Uh, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. However, however, during that period, they increased. 
That's the period we're talking about where they increased and where they multiplied. So it wasn't totally a fruitless period. God still was at work even when he wasn't speaking or hearing or answering. And how was he at work? He was allowing the Israelites to be fruitful and multiply. And here's something else that I want to throw out. Remember, this is under systematic Egyptian torture. This is where they said, let us deal wisely with these Israelites. You know, one of the questions is how come the Jewish people are so smart? How come they've learned to be so intelligent? And I'll, I'll give you a, a, a horrible answer, at least one of the answers, is their suffering. They have suffered so much. Because wisdom is born through a lot of suffering. When you are having an internal conflict with a demon, or with your flesh, or with the spirit of someone else who is attacking you, or falsely accused you, what do you do? Do you either cave in or you learn to wrestle and fight with those spirits? And when you're fighting, this is a way that we grow and learn about spiritual warfare and where we learn to get insights and wisdom from God. It's almost like an internal wrestle. Do you know even the Muslims, the Muslims that, you know what they call this? They call it a jihad. I'm not talking about the outside jihad. This is the inside, the internal jihad, where you're wrestling with these demons. And when you're under persecution and affliction, uh, it's a, it's, um, even though it's not pleasant, it is a way where uh, we grow, we learn new things, we, uh, we increase in wisdom. So God was with them. He saw their affliction. He heard their cry. And then he said, I have come down to save them. Now, I just want to find one verse in, uh, in the Hebrew, what it says in that verse that we read <clears throat> in Exodus 2.24. I want to see what the Hebrew word is. V'yishma Elohim, and God heard it's nick. Niktam, uh, their their affliction. He 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 heard and he saw their affliction, their groaning, and he veizko Elohim et brito, and he remembered his brit, his covenant et Abraham et Yitzchak ve et Yaakov, Abraham and Isaac, veyira Elohim, and so God looked at Bnei Israel veyada Elohim. All it says is, and God looked and he knew. That's the word, viyada. He knew. In English, it says he was concerned about them. But in the, in, the, uh, in the Hebrew, it's he knew. Okay? So if you're being persecuted, God not only sees, not only hears, but he knows very, very well. Okay. Uh, next is a very important part of this study today, everyone. And now we see some messianic seeds because the Lord is going to raise up a deliverer. Go to chapter 2, verse 1. Go back a couple of verses. Look what it says in verse 1. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Who are we talking about? Moshe. That's Hebrew for Moses. And she, she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a, a good child, she hid him for three months. Now, it's interesting. When you see a little baby boy or a little baby girl, and you're looking over the crib and you're smiling, do you say, oh, it's such a good child? Do you use that word? No. You usually would use a word like he's a cutie or he's adorable. But the Hebrew word, it's he, he's a good child. 
And um, some of the commentators, the, the sages, they're all kind of uh, in unity about that. And that basically this, the word good, it kind of takes us back to creation that everything that the Lord saw was good, meaning that this was a creation, this child was a creation of God, and that he had God's seal of approval on him, meaning he was favored, and he had uh, uh, the call of God over his life. Of course, this is just this is what we call a, a commentary, you know, a parush, a midrash in Hebrew. Welcome, Hal. Um, this is, this is uh, you know, it's just one word. The, the, they looked on the child that he was good. But we, we have to really dig in to find out what does that mean. And it's probably he was favored. Uh, he, and again, the writer as I say, could be connecting us to the creation account where everything that God looked upon was good. And the sense of it had, uh, or Moses had God's seal of approval over his life. But these are messianic seeds, everyone, because Moses was going to become the deliverer. He was going to not only become the deliverer, he was going to become the mediator between God and the people. He was a, a shepherd as well. He was going to shepherd the people. Uh, he was going to be like the chief shepherd under God's shepherding. And so, um, but for Moses to receive that call, go to chapter three, verse one, everyone. Hey, Missy, welcome. Go to chapter 3, verse 1. Look what it says. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And that phrase I want to touch on. I will go to the side and see the strange sight. You know, Moses, he could have stayed on the straight and narrow and carried on his business. But he actually made an effort to go and see. And I think there's something about the shepherding nature. See, as a shepherd, Moses probably many times had to leave his flock and go out of the way and do certain things. And I think we see something in the character of a shepherd. In this case, it's Moses. He went out of his way. That's what shepherds do. They have to go out of their way. If there's danger from other shepherds or danger from wild animals or beasts, they have to go out of their way to save the lives of their flocks and their herds and even their own family. Because in, in, uh, in the ancient days, there was always quarrelings between shepherds and shepherds, between tribesmen and tribesmen herdsmen and herdsmen. If, if, if Moses had not gone out of his way, he would have missed the boat. He went, he saw this tree burning. Now, everyone has their interpretation of what this tree burning is, but we know based on the, the, the new covenant that one of the nat or one of the characteristics of God's nature is he is a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. And the tree obviously represents man. You know, Psalm 1, it says, man is like a tree planted by the rivers. Whether you agree with that or, or whether that's the correct interpretation or not, what we do know is that this fire 
supernaturally did not consume the tree. That's the interesting thing here. And I think something drew Moses to this tree. And what was Moses thinking when he saw this tree alight, burning, and yet not being consumed? Uh, perhaps he was thinking about the analogy of man being like a tree, God consume God setting his soul on fire and yet not consuming him. I don't know. Maybe you have some thoughts about it. And during our uh, discussion period, please feel free to share them. But it was here that Moses got his call. Uh, and, um, you know, this is where Moses found himself after fleeing the face of Pharaoh. When Moses went and uh, tried to uh, intervene where he saw injustice and it was found out, he actually fled and uh, he finds himself in the wilderness, everyone. And it was here in that wilderness and by the way, I don't think Moses did anything wrong. I used to think that Moses was, was wrong doing that by intervening and that he, it was just a, his flesh rose up. But I've studied that passage and I don't think he did anything wrong. And I'll tell you why. Because in the, in the Hebrew, it says he went over and he hit the Egyptian. It doesn't say he killed him or went to murder him. What it does say, it says he looked this way and he looked that way. He looked to find out if anyone was looking. And he went to intervene this injustice. Now, remember, Moses was an Egyptian ruler at this stage. Okay? But he saw the Hebrews being mistreated. And we don't know exactly when he came to the revelation that he was a Hebrew. But obviously, there came a time in his life where his loyalties were divided between Egypt and his own people, the Hebrews. And I believe this, that, I believe this is why he looked to the right, he looked to the left to see. Why? Because he was an Egyptian, and he knew that by helping a slave, it wouldn't have looked good to the other Egyptians. So he wanted to make sure no other Egyptians were looking. And then he did it. He, he accidentally, I believe, ended up killing the guy. He buried him. But the next day, someone said, you know, you're going to kill us like you killed the other. He realized that he'd been busted. He'd been, you know, sprung. And he fled. And this was his breaking away. Now he was making his... Uh, split from Egypt, and it says in Hebrews in the New Testament, uh, by faith, by faith, Pharaoh fl uh, fled Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Now, that verse, everyone, not fearing the wrath of the king. Why did he flee? It's an interesting point. He fled, and yet it says in Hebrews 11, it wasn't out of fear of the king. It's, but it does say by faith, he fled, not fearing the wrath of the king, and he esteemed the sufferings of Christ more higher than the pleasures of Egypt. God, guys, this was his call. This was the call of Moses to get out of Egypt. And, you know, maybe when Moses went through that period, he was wondering, where on God's earth am I? What am I doing in this desert? He took that step by faith to leave Egypt, but and that's one thing. But when you get to the desert, it's like, okay, now what, God? Now what? You know, I, I did that by faith, but now what? And surely the burning bush came and the call of God came. Moses, I've seen the affliction. I've heard their groans. And now I have come. And you're going to be the man, Moses that I am going to 
sin. So this is a powerful story of the call of Moses, everyone. Now, uh, to sum, sum up our study, I started off by saying in Hebrew, the word for Exodus is the word Shemot, which means names. And Genesis ends with all the Israelites getting named and getting blessed. The book of Exodus begins by giving the account of the 70 Israelites who fled. They were listed by name. And the importance when the affliction and the suffering under the hands of Pharaoh came, that they kept their identity. Moses got to a place where his identity was challenged. His loyalties were challenged. Am I going to stay in the house of Egypt? Or am I going to do the right thing? And he chose the right thing. It was costly. He had to leave Egypt. He had to live, leave all of the, the good life of Egypt. And now he's in the desert. And as someone wrote, he's going to be there for 40 years. 40 years. Now, that's another topic. and That's not really our discussion today. But we know in hindsight, that Moses was about to lead the Israelites in the wilderness. No, sorry, let me rephrase it. In another 40 years, Moses was going to lead the Israelites for four years. But first, he had to learn what it was like to live in the desert for 40 years before he led the Israelites in the desert for four years. Because all in all, he was 80 years in the desert. So, those 40 years in the wilderness, everyone, for Moses, they were not a waste of time. If he was going to shepherd the Israelites, he needed to learn how to be shepherded in the wilderness. And I think that's part of our walk with God, because I mentioned earlier, these are messianic seeds. And why do I say that? Because Moses himself said sometime later on towards the end of his life in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, he said, the Lord, one day, the Lord your God will raise up unto you one like me. Listen to him. Now, if, if, and let me just share this. Do you know last week on the Mediterranean coast, to a uh, near a place that you've all been to, I'm sure, Caesarea, not Caesarea Philippi, but Caesarea Maritima, which Herod built. They found a coin. Uh, it's a, it's not a 2,000 year old coin. It's a 1,700 year old coin, and the coin was of the Good Shepherd. Okay, now Caesarea historically is a very big Christian site. The first bishop of Caesarea was a man called Eusebius, and he had a library of 20,000 books right there at Caesarea. So they obviously minted a coin called the Good Shepherd coin. Now, in Judaism, if I was to ask you who would be the Good Shepherd in Judaism, you'd probably think automatically two guys one, Moses because he was the shepherd in the wilderness. And number two, David, because David also was a shepherd. And these are two of the greatest fathers in Judaism, Moses and David, probably two out of the, no, actually they would be the number one and number two. I don't know in which order, probably in that order. First Moses, then David. You'd have Elijah up there. You'd have Abraham up there. Uh, and, but they are the four big ones, but Moses and David, probably the, the two biggest. Um, so both of them were shepherds and both of them have messianic seeds in their lives. Because like I said, Moses himself said, the Lord your God will raise up unto you one like me. Now look at the life of Moses. He was the little baby that was being hunted by Pharaoh. He became a mediator between God and the people, and he became the deliverer. And guys, he is a type of the deliverer, the savior, Yeshua. 
And we talk today about the birth of Moses. Guys, what a great time for us to have a Bible study about the birth of Moses, the prototype of the Savior, because today that's what all the world is talking about, the birth of Jesus. And just like Moses was hounded by Pharaoh, Jesus was being hounded by King Herod, where Herod killed all the babies of Bethlehem, all the baby boys. And then in the same way Moses grew up to be a mediator, in 1 Timothy 2.5, it says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And let me tell you, in, in, in Luke 22, when Jesus said to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. Have you ever wondered when Peter went away after he failed the Lord miserably, what was it that drew Peter back? It was the Lord and it was in his intercessory prayer. And I, and guys, I want to say this to you because I was having this conversation just earlier today. If we know people who have been believers and have walked away, look at Luke 22, what Jesus said about Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Those believers have been sifted by Satan. But look at the next part of the verse where Jesus said, but I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. Guys, that's a call for us. That's a call for us to intercede and to pray for these people that their faith does not fail. And we can be a bridge. We can be uh, the interceders with the Lord Jesus. Because it says, we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that's a big part of our call to intercede. Uh, so, and then the other messianic seater, of course, is David. David also was a shepherd, and uh, uh, Jesus is from the house of David, from the throne of David, from the seed of David, and uh, God promised to David, uh, of the increase of your government shall be no end, and there will never cease anyone to sit on the throne of David. And then it says in Isaiah 22, 22, I think, and to him, that's the Messiah, Jesus, and to him, I give the keys of the kingdom and whatever he opens, no man can close and whatever he closes, no man can open. So guys, the Israelites, they kept their identity through that suffering, through that 400 years of affliction. And that's the key to our Bible studies, Shemot, names. When whatever we go through, everyone, we got to know who we are. We got to keep that identity. No matter what comes our way, no matter what affliction, we keep our identity. And like Moses, like Moses, who came to a point in his life where he had to choose between Egypt and fleeing, choosing the afflictions of Christ, we got to ask ourselves, do we have the faith to do that because like in Moses's case he had the faith to leave but he found himself in the wilderness and when we find ourselves out of one thing we got to continue in our faith and let me close by just sharing a little anecdote about faith a story about a a, a teacher in a class full with little children seven-year-old children and he asked the children, okay, everyone, what is three times two? And one of the little boys cried out, six. And the teacher said, correct. And another seven-year-old boy in the class said, why? And the teacher said, what? And the little boy said, why is it six? And the teacher said, don't ask silly questions. You're a, a seven-year-old boy. I'm, you know, a grown-up. I've lived long enough. Uh, just believe me. 
uh, when I say it is six. Now, that's actually not the right way to answer uh, a child that asks that question. The correct way to answer is to say the reason why three times two is six is if you take two apples, two apples, and two apples, three loads of two apples, and you count it, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's your answer why three times two is six. There you have it. And the point of this little anecdote story, everyone, is that when it comes to mathematics and when it comes to things like apples, uh, it's logic, it's sense. You can break it down. But guys, when it comes to faith, sometimes it's not like math. It's not like breaking it down. Sometimes faith is when you're moved to do things like Moses, who saw injustice and he moved upon it. And he accidentally ended up doing something. And yet through the providence of God, he had to leave Egypt. And he finds himself in the desert by chance that it was that same desert that the Lord appeared to him in that burning bush. And the Lord calls and says, I am that I am, which means I am the all existing God. I'm the God who was, who is, and who will be. And friends, we can guarantee in our walk what it, Paul says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. In other words, when we, with all of our good intentions, whatever we do by faith, God will honor that, even if we make a mistake, even if we do screw up. And we do. Peter screwed up. Peter got it wrong. But we have the interceding Lord for us. Praise that our faith does not fail. And so let us keep our identity. Remember, when the Lord was at the Jordan River, he heard a voice from heaven say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I mean, talk about a strong identity that the Lord Jesus had hearing that voice from the father. This is my beloved son. But then what happened a few days later? He was in the wilderness being bombarded by the devil. If you are the son of God, the devil was attacking his identity, his personhood, if you are the son of God. And this is what the enemy tries to do when we sin, when, we're, uh, when we're, we feel a little distant from God, when our, our flesh is weak, um, all kinds of circumstances, when we're falsely accused, whatever, the enemy will try and attack us with who are we? And this is why it's so important. We know who we are. We cleave to who we are. And we know our, the call of God on our lives, no matter how small, no how, matter how big. Because being a shepherd in those days, they were the common kind of work that people did. Moses did not know that being a shepherd to those little lambs, those little sheep, those cattle, whatever he was in charge he did not know that that was all preparation for in the future. He was going to shepherd people. And guys, whatever we're going through, if we try to bring the wisdom of the Lord, the perspective of the Lord, even if we feel like we're in a wilderness, nothing is wasted. We will be being fruitful and multiply in one way or another. As long as we are seeking God's kingdom first, as long as we are uh, kingdom minded people, we cannot lose. Even if we lose our Egypt, our things from the world, we cannot lose. Amen. Thank you. You could have got another hour, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, I didn't want to keep you away from your turkey. <laughs> you know, you know, I don't. My saying is God didn't remove the Red Sea. He parted it. And sometimes God doesn't remove our problems, but he makes a way through them. Wow. That's a good one. I've never heard that one. Love it. Yeah. That is a good one. And the reason why I was laughing earlier, um, 
Haran was when I read that God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as if, as if he forgot, you know, that was, that, that's what right. was funny, you know, guys, yeah. God forgot, but he remembered later, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, when you mentioned um, uh, uh, son of Moses and son of David, we also read uh, Mashiach ben Joseph. Joseph is another important one because Joseph is the one that uh, saved his people from starvation. You know, when I mentioned all the major patriarchs, I knew I'd forgotten one, and that's the one, Joseph. Thank you. Absolutely. Wouldn't Joseph, Mary's husband, be the same kind of thing because he was shepherding his wife and, and Christ? I suppose. Yeah. Good point. Good point. You know? That whole story of, of, of the pregnancy and everything. Um, I mean, if you really break down that story, uh, Joseph, he had every, every right to put her away, which is what Luke tells us he wanted to do. Um, because, I mean, are you going to believe your girlfriend if she comes up to you and she says, hey, sweetheart, I'm pregnant. And God is the father, you know, are you going to believe her or are you going to think it's, it's one of these Jerusalem syndrome people? Obviously you're going to believe it's a Jerusalem syndrome person. There's no way you'd believe that. And Joseph didn't, and he went to put her away. So the angel had to come to Joseph and tell Joseph. But even then, I believe it was a challenge for Joseph because the community was small they would have been talking, gossiping. They would have done their math. They would have seen her stomach grow and all of that. And, um, you know, he knew it wasn't his child, but he still went along. So his identity also would have been a challenge. Like, you know, I'm the surrogate father, but I'm not really the father. And, and yet he was obedient he, by faith. He, he went along uh, that ride. Uh, and, and I'm sure there was a reproach that he had to bear with it. Yeah, good, uh, good point, Missy. Um, I wanted to also share um, a little anecdote about something that happened to me a few, a few years ago in regards to shepherding. Um, and it was back in... Uh, it was 2017 when I had just moved into my my new uh, rental uh, on a larger property, and the landlord has a flock of of goats. And one uh, one weekend they went off on a vacation, and he said, you know, "We have somebody coming in and checking on the animals once in a while." So I came home from work one day, and I was pulling into the driveway. And that pack of animals were grazing out by the mailbox out along the street. And I panicked for the poor animals like, oh, my gosh, what do I do? So that's where I became an ad hoc shepherd. <laughs> Trying to <laughs> shepherd these animals that don't know my voice, don't know me from anybody. They only know the landlord as their owner and shepherd. And I got a taste of trying to shepherd a flock of animals that don't know me. Um, I tried to chase them this way. And of course they would turn and run the other way. And it got scary because they kept running into the street. So luckily cars were, the owned the drivers were very compassionate. They would stop and we got them into the property. And then these two women that were in large SUVs, they both pulled over and said, do you need some help? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they helped me corral them and shepherd them into the farther back into the property so they weren't in danger of being hit by cars but um another man came by that knew the landlord and so he helped me as well but again it was very difficult because these animals didn't know us so of course they didn't trust us and the and the larger ram of the pack he was always in the front with his head lowered like he's guarding his flock very symbolically. And the whole entire time I kept saying, okay, Jesus, I understand what you're going through. <laughs> Luckily we got them corralled into their pen and I let the landlord know and my heartbeat started settling down back to normal. 
but um, That's a great experience wow <laughs> what a what a thing to learn yeah so I, okay yeah. i've had a little taste of shepherding <laughs> and i wow. and, and in your lesson today where where moses was being taught to shepherd the people um with the with the practice being the animals i'm like yes i can see that i understand that <laughs> And actually, as you're talking, Gina, it kind of brought me to the realization, I never thought about it, but my job for the last, not counting COVID, but before COVID, my job as a tour guide, in many ways, it's, it's, there's a lot of shepherding uh, in that, you know, guys, we've got to get on the bus, get off the bus, we've got to be here at this time, hey, don't get, you know, catch up, don't be late, and in fact, all of you pretty much were my sheep. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, in a way, I, I have learned. I have learned. And you know, sometimes you you get you get uh, very elderly people with with physical disabilities, and you got to be patient. You got to you got to you got to wait. Uh, people that are late, um, people that you know want to go this way, where you say no, 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 we're going that way. So yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, I never, I never looked at it that way, but yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, but, uh, thank you very much for our message this morning. It was very timely. You're uh, welcome. And by the way, I did refer to you all as sheep, not goats. Good, thank uh, you. <laughs> I'm, I'm playing the politically correct uh, person today. <laughs> <All right>. uh, <laughs> Does anybody else have anything they want to share with us this morning? Any questions you have? Um, I've referred to this family member a few times now. I have a nephew that's kind of straight away, completely, I'll say, rejected the family and his faith. And so it really struck me, Aharon, when you said about um, we are also intercessors along with Christ and how Christ, you know, interceded for uh, Peter. Uh, and um, yeah, it, but it crossed my mind that I wonder, you know, did Christ only intercede the one time to the father? Because there's been a lot of intercession going on for this family, you know? Yeah, good question. Um, I guess I get, and I, I, I think that's questions kind of cross my mind before but i guess if we're not seeing any results we just got to we got no choice but to keep yeah. interceding keep praying not to give up we got no choice yeah yeah i mean ultimately the, the decision is theirs but um uh you know i i think i think it's an act of uh, responsibility and love that we take these people before the father i mean uh yeah there's not much more we can do uh, but as i say it's not just responsibility it's an act of love if, if they're not going to listen to our words at least we can pray for them can't be prayer brother you just can't be prayer right um also, what I love about Shmote, and I mentioned that in the chat, that this is the first time that God actually revealed his name. You know, this big thing about yud heh vav -Hey, that unpronounceable name. Well, God gave his name. He said, Eya Asher Eya. That's, that's who, that's his name. I am that I am, or I will be who I will be. And he even says what his name is. What's the big deal about yud heh vav -Hey as far as the, his, his un unpronounceable name? It just, he gave his name in the Bible. He said it directly. I know. And for those of you who don't really understand what Gary is getting at is that Jewish people, they, they struggle actually pronouncing. No, actually, it's not that they struggle. They will not pronounce the name of God. They say it's too sacred. And yet uh, Gary's just brought to our attention that uh, God revealed it. Mm -hmm. um, so why not? In fact, if you look in the book of Psalms, the psalmist a, a number of times says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. In fact, even in English, when they write the English word God, G-O-D, they will do G 
dash D. They won't even put the name God, G-O-D. So, um, but anyway, you know what? That's, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to criticize them. I just think they're missing out. They're yeah. missing out. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anything else anybody wants to share this morning or today? <laughs> I thought it was interesting too about um, your take on the Moses when he hit the rock. And that he was not, it was not, is that where, I mean, is that what you were referring to? Or no, I no, I was referring to when he killed the uh, Egyptian. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Looks like uh, that's pretty good right now. Do you have anything else you want to add or on, or do you want to think we're good? No, I think that's uh, that's it, Gina. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, thanks everybody again. So, Aaron, will you go ahead and close us out in prayer today, then, please? Yes, with pleasure. Lord God, we praise and thank you for your word. We thank you that you are the God who sees our affliction, who hears our affliction, and Lord, even when you don't answer. Uh, Lord, which for us as humans is very frustrating at times. Lord, we confess that. I confess, Lord, my lack of patience, my lack of grace uh, when you do not answer the way I want you to answer. And Lord, then it can lead me to getting angry even or, or uh, going into unbelief uh, and questioning you, Lord. Forgive me for that. Uh, and even rebelling, Lord, even uh, as your people of old who were grumblers and complainers and then they rebelled. Lord, it just leads to so much when we don't understand. But Lord, we see that behind the scenes you are at working and we see how the Israelites multiplied and they grew. And Lord, we, we see that, um, that when we are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then we are growing and we are multiplying. And I pray that for every one of us here, Lord. Keep us uh, kingdom focused, Lord, which is all about faith, all about walking by faith, not trying to work out the two, the three times two, but to work out, uh, to hear your voice, to see the burning bush, to draw aside when we sense you calling and to stand up for injustice when it's time to stand up like Moses did and to count the cost and to keep our identity, Lord, no matter what gets fired at us. We are your children. We are your soldiers. We are your army. And we praise and thank you, Lord, for your word that gives us light uh, for this, uh, for our walk in this life. So, Lord, I pray your blessing on everyone here. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you shalom, his peace. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Lord, the Savior of the world. The one whom Simeon lifted up in the temple and said, now my eyes have seen your Yeshua, your salvation, a light to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people, Israel. Lord, bring revelation to the Jewish people. Bring revelation to people in our family who don't know you, that Jesus is the Savior. And that, what, and that is what Christmas is all about. In your name, we ask and pray and give you thanks. Amen. Good. Hey, Aaron, Aaron, can you, Aaron, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes. Also, I'm right.